This episode of the podcast is brought to you by Rock and Roll Denim, Pendleton Whiskey, Bill Fick Ford, the WCRA, and Resist All. Born in the iconic American Western town of Pendleton, Oregon, and taking its name from one of the most revered rodeos in the world, my absolute favorite rodeo, known for the grass, the Pendleton Roundup. Pendleton Whiskey is a modern celebration of a century-old tradition. Pendleton Whiskey is barrel-aged in American oak and cut with Glacier Fred spring water from Oregon's Mount Hood. For an uncommonly smooth, rich taste, and complex flavor, the Pendleton Whiskey brand honors a heritage that inspires us to live boldly, never lose sight of the values we believe in, and taste the moment, wherever we may be. The legacy of the American cowboy is forged in every single bottle. A taste of true Western tradition is always worth raising a glass to. Discover more at PendletonWhiskey.com. Oh, and Pendleton Whiskey is the official whiskey of Pro Rodeo and of the PBR. Pendleton Blended Canadian Whiskey, 40% alcohol by volume, Pendleton Distilleries, Lawrenceburg, Indiana. Please drink responsibly. Bill Fick Ford, the number one Super Duty dealer in the entire country, is still taking care of their customers. It's hard to get trucks right now, but there's some perks when you're the number one Super Duty dealer in the country. You still got trucks. Go to BillFickFordHuntsville.com to get the no bull discounts that no one else is giving during this crazy time that we're living in. Bill Fick Ford is still the place to go. In fact, if you ask me, it's the only place to get a new Super Duty dealer today. Bill Fick Ford. The Women's Rodeo World Championship is the largest purse in the history of women's rodeo, paying out a total of $750,000. The event will take place October 26th through the 29th in Las Vegas at the South Point Arena. Each Women's Rodeo World Champion will take home a minimum of $60,000 each, while the all-around champion will collect a minimum of $20,000. The championship event just is out equal money in all disciplines. This is your chance at a piece of that $750,000 purse. Earn your position on the leaderboard by nominating your team roping, breakaway, and barrel racing runs with the WCRA. Visit womensrodeoworldchampionship.com to learn more on how to qualify for the richest event in history of women's rodeo. Again, that's womensrodeoworldchampionship.com. What sets Resist All apart is the legacy of the cowboys who wear the brand. These traditions are passed down from fathers to sons, from heroes to future champions. Since 1927, Resist All has been handcrafting the finest American-made cowboy hats. Generation after generation, we live it. This is The Gage with host Chance Conradu. Are you freaking serious? It's Conrado. This is The Gage, and I am Chance Conrado. On this episode of the podcast, we have got Luke Pell. Luke is a pretty amazing guy. Actually, he mirrors a lot of my qualities, so we really hit it off, as I'm sure you'll be able to tell in this podcast. Hyper-political, because, you know, that's just the world right now. But uh, Luke went to West Point. He served in the military. He is a very eclectic man, and I really enjoy his company and everything he has to say. He was on The Bachelorette. I think it was season 11. He was supposed to be The Bachelor, but uh, anyway, whatever with that. It's uh, it's certainly not the most interesting thing about Luke. There's so many great things about him. He's an awesome guy, and I encourage you guys to listen to the whole podcast because there is so much great stuff in this. Check it out. So yeah. give me like the uh, the Sunday, Sunday, Sunday um, preset. Yeah, we can go with that. Where I can have the warm, uh, good, nice, warm radio DJ voice. There you go. How, how do we want to start this? What it's already started, as right. you said, Ty. You're the you're the producer. I'll wait on you. Well, we've already started. We were having great conversation, and then you walked in with your hat backwards and your <laughs> SD cards and threw the whole plan out. And Luke was like, "You guys don't have your shit together. I'm out." Okay, you ready? Uh, uh, yes, we are ready. Perfect. Boom. <laughs> it's on video, too. <laughs> Pretend it was a Coors Light, not a ranch yeah, water. It makes it more yeah. manly. <laughs> yeah, ranch water's a little weak. That's fine. They're not bad. They all taste the same. At least it's not a LaCroix. Ooh. Ooh. Oh. That was a shot. <laughs> that was a shot. The personal insults uh, early on. I, I love like it. I like LaCroix. <laughs> 
I've I've had my day with LaCroix. I drink a lot of them. I'm not going to lie. It's fine. You know what? The best one is a Topo Chico. It's more manly. It's in a glass bottle. Yeah. So. Well, yeah. They're really branching out. I saw the hard seltzers they're trying to go into. They're now. in the fridge. If you get real frisky and want to break away from the ranch water. <laughs> you know what I do like? I do like the Topo Chico commercial with the Latina girl in the little outfit swinging yeah, the rope. So. That is nice. That's yeah, a good commercial. Really good branding. It, um, it is. It, for my taste anyway. Well, you can get hard seltzer in any form now. From anybody, I mean, everybody's making seltzer waters. Yeah, they even I even saw at the store they've got a hard soft seltzer now, where <laughs> hard, they just take nice. the where they take the alcohol out. I don't really know what the point okay. of that is. Well, all right, I like it. That's that's an that's an interesting way to fry that pancake. It works good in a town like a college town like this, or probably Austin, because yeah. everyone would be like, "Oh my God, it's better for the environment. It's, it's <laughs> soft, but it's also hard. That we can be both things at once." And we're doing cardboard straws, yes, because we're saving fish. And the turtles. Don't turtles, forget the sea that's turtles. What it is, yeah. The sea turtles. In Austin of all places. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Luke, I'm glad you joined us and you had a uh, a flight from Austin that yeah. took longer than a drive from Austin, so that's fun. Yeah, my logistics uh didn't really work out for me. Um would have been a lot better to drive. Probably could have rode a horse up here and made it quicker than I'd sat on the tarmac in Austin for two hours. But I'm here. Um and uh, Riley only took one wrong turn uh, coming from the airport. That's embarrassing. She's supposed to be a pro from getting from the airport. But I guess you're going to Love Field. Yeah, right? Love Field. It's different. Yeah. Different place. It was a hike. So, anyway, glad to be here. Thanks, yeah, thanks for too. having me on. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. We're glad you're here and welcome to uh, to the studio and everything. And you have a pretty interesting persona, yeah. I guess. And you grew up kind of doing the ranching thing and then branched yeah. out into a lot of things. So, maybe you could just kind of give us the, the rundown on... You know, you're yeah. starting the world. Uh, we got some highs and some lows. I've done. I've made some good decisions and some bad ones. Um, you know, I grew up very uh, grassroots, uh, Burnett, Texas, uh, 281 and Highway 29, one red light, you know. 3A high school football, and that was, you know, what I inherently was. Um, and then, you know, then you just start this whole daisy chain of events of, of life that, that come in and, you know, uh, faith, my faith is a big part of my life. And I feel like, you know, everything happens for a reason. And wh what I got into and where I was, was, you know, God had a purpose for my life. And so, um, you know, that's my end all be all. And, and I'll continue to believe that. But, uh, I mean, even, even, you know, sometimes maybe, I don't know if God meant for me to be on the, the bachelorette. That's probably a low point in my life. <laughs> so, <laughs> reality tv but hey you know uh the, I, I i was very curious and uh walked into some open doors and i'm a guy i guess i i i, I like trying different things you know um i don't know if you guys are into enneagram if you've ever looked into that enneagram is a personality test and you can it, it's it's a one to a nine and it's kind of a it categorizes you know what you are and why and gives a background for why your behaviors are the way they are and why you play out the way you do and in your relationships, in your decisions in life and kind of what your personality is. And so what's it called again? Because I Enneagram. Riley, can you write that down for me? Because I really need to know what my fucking issues you, are. <laughs> <laughs> Badly. I'm telling you, go Google Enneagram. You can get the free basic test after this and you'll find out what your number is. So I'm an Enneagram three, um, which I didn't find out till later in life, but uh, it is just, you're, you're, you're kind of a chameleon and you learn and like to fit into different situations. And, um, that, you know, I didn't know that, but I, that was the life that I was living before. And so, um, so when I got an offer to go play football, um, for army at West Point, for instance, out of high school, you know, um, that was my first venture out of Burnett, Texas. And I was kind of saying, Hey, why not? Let's see what's behind door number three, you know? And, and so I went there and, you know, that's th those type of decisions when you're leaving, leaving high school and making college decisions as it does for anybody, it makes changes the tra trajectory of your life, you know? And, uh, and so for me, that was at West Point, which was a very rude awakening, a long way from home. It's in upstate New York, uh, military school, had no military background or familiarity from my family or anything like that. And I just ended up up there in a fully, engaged military lifestyle playing college football in West Point, New York. And anyway, so that became my adult foundation for what I would be after in the professional world and, and started the 
I guess the build of what my resume would be and what my affinity for choosing careers would be and those type of things. And, uh, you know, all from a guy that grew up in Burnett, Texas, uh, you know, raising cows and horses and stuff like that. And so it's been interesting. I wish some, I tell people sometimes I wish I had, uh, I need about, I probably need, you know, maybe like, uh, 200, 250 years to do everything I'm trying to do. You know, I'm trying to live like three different lives and I don't have enough time to do all the things I'm, I'm trying to do. And, uh, so, you know, one of those lives would be in, you know, the 1870s, I think, you know, uh, post civil war, maybe pony express. I don't know. (laughs) And, uh, you know, and then it's, it's, it's just been funny. I mean, you know, there's the whole military, you can spend your whole life in the military. I know a lot of people who do, and, you know, I was one decision away from saying, okay, well, do I think I can spend the next 25 years professionally and be an officer in the military and be a, a, you know, a a colonel and then a general or whatever, you can pursue that if you want. And, uh, I didn't, you know, I, 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 I just came to a point where I was like, I'm going to get out of the military now and I'm going to try to have a little bit more control of the destiny of where I'm going. And I don't think the military is where, you know, where I'm supposed to be, where God has me. And so, yeah, man, I just started just open, opening up doors. And so I went to the oil field and I was in uh, Oklahoma city after the military, uh, working for a company called Chesapeake energy about 10 years ago, um, as a drilling foreman for them. And that was a whole nother world to, to be, uh, introduced to and, you know, but you adapt and you kind of, you figure it out and how to learn how to talk your way through that industry and, and, and provide value to a company and did that for a couple of years. I was like, ah, well, actually I wasn't feeling it, but also they went through and laid off about, I think they went through 30%, 40% layoff. Um, they got a new CEO and the whole thing. And so me and a bunch of my peers were young guys there. And so we had, you know, a lot less tenure than a lot of those folks. And so, we actually got laid off, and then I went to a uh, business consulting firm down in um, College Station, Texas, called the Flipping Group. Which that again, and and I guess if there's any trend to any of this, um, is it gave me a place to learn more about myself and what my purpose in life was, and um, and it was a lot about. I learned how much our lives revolve around relationships, you know? And so it doesn't really matter what industry you pick um, or where you're at in life, but it's the quality of the relationships and the people that are around you that make, you know, your lifestyle and the quality of your life better and also give you a platform to have more impact in the world and the legacy that you might leave, you know, after, after we're gone, because, you know, like we were talking about before um, we started recording, you know, the the years go by quick, you know. <laughs> and so I, I think that, you know, I just had a birthday the other uh, the other week and, and, and I was talking to my parents and I'm like, man, you know, they're already, my parents are talking, you know, we're talking succession plans about, you know, what to do with the place back, back home. And we're talking about, you know, it's just the next generation and all these things. And you're like, man, life goes by, it comes at you fast, you know. And, uh, and so... Uh, you know, what we have to leave is, is a legacy and the impact uh, and the tools that we're given uh, to then give to the next generation. And I think that's, you know, a little bit of all of our, our, our purpose and our, and our ability to impact ne- the next generation, you know. And so that, that's really my mission. And so as, as much ADD has been in my career choices and the different things that I've been doing so far, um, I've learned a lot about myself and I've learned that my perspective, my worldview has broadened. And uh, I think that I'm at a point where um, I feel very educated in the world that, that we live in, the world around us. And I want to I wanna be able to give back now, right? It's kind of the, 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 second, um, the second gear of my life that I think I've, I've learned, I've learned, I've developed, I've developed um, through careers and education and all these things. And now it's like, okay, what, what's my impact on the world, you know? And so that's the season that I think I'm in now and, uh, I'm entering that season. And so I'm, I'm fully embraced and I feel like I'm prepared for it and I've got a lot to give and a lot to do. So, um, there's a sense of urgency there as well to say, Hey, uh, what, how are you giving back? What are you going to do to give back and, and leave impact on the world and change the world, you know? Um, and it starts with, it starts with one person. And so that's, that's kind of where I'm at. 
Well, and what's what's awesome, and I want to go way, way back to what you said earlier, but what's awesome is we have so much accessibility to things that can make that impact, right? Yeah. Like just coming on a show like this, right. what you say can have more impact on somebody than a lot of other things that maybe could, especially in the past. Like right. all it takes is you saying one or two things that really resonate with somebody and boom, it's a grassroots change. You may not see it directly sure. or I may not. And he certainly won't cause he won't be here. <laughs> He'll be late with getting SD cards, but it, it is really, and, and there's so much that you said that I agree with and that I feel personally mm -hmm. at a very deep level, the getting pulled multiple directions and, yeah. and trying to do so many things at once. Right. And, uh, it's, it is so true what you said that there's just not enough time Yeah, and time goes by fast. But, uh, all that being said, I wanted to go way back to what you said in regards to West Point, you said that that's what sets your framework for a mm -hmm. lot of your decisions. So right. what I'm curious about is, I mean, what were you like before that? Right? Like, what was your personality like when you were a kid growing up on the ranch in Burnett and before you decided that you were going to go to West Point? Because, I mean, that is a, yeah. a, most people have a specific background in military uh, and, and all these different things. There's generations of military personnel whose children go, generation after generation, go to West Point for very okay. specific reasons because it right. opens up a huge, huge doors if you want to pursue that. So what were you like in your formative years before, yeah. you know, you went to what you said is what framed you for the rest of your life. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I think my formative years, um, and this is something that for me, um, I try to humbly appreciate it and not take it for granted, uh, because, uh, it's a huge problem in the country, I think, and, and, and across America and across the world is that, um, I was fortunate and blessed to have a, a family, uh, and, and two parents that were very passionate. I mean, maybe their biggest passion in, 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 the, in their life was raising their kids. They were intentional about it. Um, and, 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 you know, it didn't matter what background they came from or what education they had or ability to raise kids, but they were intentional about giving everything that they had to be able to raise the kids the right way. Um, you know, a faith-centered family where their value system is 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 rock solid and your kids are prepared for whatever they will see in the in the real world you know and i think for me you know growing up in a <clears throat> in a faith based home uh with you know with with christ in our life and my parents um committed to that uh and then my parents actually homeschooled us um i went into public school um to start we <laughs> We lived in a little red brick house uh, in, 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 inside the city limits in Burnett, Texas when I was born. And uh, we lived one block away from the elementary school. And so my parents, they, uh, they put, us in, put me in school um, my first year. And then after that year, they thought that they could do better than what the public school was doing there at that time. And, and so they decided to homeschool. And... Uh, they had no formal education on how to be an educator themselves or anything like that. And they just believed that that was so important to them to educate their kids in life lessons, just as much as what the public school curriculum, you know, was going to be able to, to give me, um, that they, they, they started homeschooling. And so I am, you know, there's a lot of people doing it now for different reasons, um, for various reasons, but it, I, I'm a big advocate of that. Just that, that passion for parents to take control of and take responsibility for their, their kids' future, you know? Yeah, I agree. And, and what you just said about it kind of making a renaissance right now. Yeah. I mean, it's for totally different reasons. Right. But I think it is the absolute best reason. Yeah. Like if you're a parent, because like our parents' generation, certainly the one before that, it seems like they put a lot more into their kids because it was just a less... I'm going to misuse a word, but a less narcissistic generation, sure. right? Like the, our generation of people as they have kids, like it's really hard for people to care less about themselves and right. more about their kids. It's just something you notice. And you, even if you have kids, you can notice it in yourself, I think. Right. Right. Um, and you have to be cognizant of that, but you were seeing people in all these different States stepping up and saying, well, I don't like what you're trying to do to my kids mm -hmm. or what your, or it doesn't even matter what your beliefs are. Like you can agree with this side or that side, or you can be pro vaccine or not right. or pro indoctrination or not like sure. whatever. It doesn't even matter. Like the point of the, the point of the whole thing is that, people care about their kids enough to 
because it's a sacrifice. I mean, mm-hmm. your mom, it was, I'm sure it was your mom yeah. who did the homeschooling, right? Yeah, My exactly. parents homeschooled us for a little bit too when I was a kid Yeah, for different reasons because we lived in a horse trailer going right. down the road. You <laughs> can't go to school doing that. Sure. But uh, it, it's really good to see how much parents are willing to step up against these institutions. Like, it's, like I said, it doesn't matter if you agree with them or not. Right. But, they're your kids and you know what's best for your kids. So if you don't agree with them and you're willing to pull them and take that, take the steps and make those sacrifices. I mean, I think it's just like what you said. It's the best thing ever to see yeah. people doing that again. Yeah. You know, I, the, the family unit is it's by design, uh, the most important, uh, you know, influential place for a child to be And if the family unit is not there and there's not, or at least some function of a family unit, because right, life happens and there's a lot of people in different situations. So I'm not going to take that away from people that they can't help the situation that they're in and creating, a, you know, single parents and those type of things like that, that like, well, I can't homeschool my kid and, and those things. But there's, there's different ways to have that family unit function, that mentorship function that helps those kids get to where they need to be and prepared for life. Because if you don't, uh, then we're, that's when we're talking about indoctrination, institutional knowledge. They're going to pick it up. Uh, just by happenstance, right? And there's no baton to be passed and say, intentionally, this is how we've set the trajectory of these kids' lives. If that isn't in place, who knows where these kids go, right? They just, you know, what the success is just, it's at, on, on a whim, you know, it's a, by chance, do they, do they find success in life and know uh, how to be prepared for the trials and things that they're going to, you know, inevitably encounter later down the road. So, yeah, I think we just need more grassroots focus on a family unit and intentionally growing kids uh, at at the different phases, right? When they're eight to ten, they're starting to they're starting to understand concepts of relationships and starting to understand, you know, what what it what it's like to um, what their identity is, right? And then there's the 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 teenage years, and then there's those years when they choose where they're going to go to college and what their career is going to be, and so those different seasons of that kid's life you're, you're just, you're changing multiple generations just by changing one kid's life. And so I think it's, I think it's huge. We all got to focus on that. So. Well, yeah. And, and there's, there's something to be said about breaking generational curses. I mean, it's, that's something that I personally have focused on a lot because I'm sure we can all look back at our yeah. family's history and see all of the wrong paths that maybe parents or grandparents or whoever took and be like, wow, I don't want to do that. But right. There's always this, uh, this like inherent pull to mm-hmm. kind of do for whatever reason, it's a really interesting phenomenon. Like if you study it at all, and realize that we all kind of want to inherently do the same thing that our parents, our grandparents did. Yeah. Even the mistakes. Like yeah. if you don't pay attention, you'd be like, wow. So my dad was kind of an asshole. Like, right. I'm kind of an asshole yeah. too. Yeah, if you don't exactly. watch it. And, uh, and not saying my dad's an asshole, <laughs> but, you know. Yeah, yeah, and sometimes it's like self-awareness, right? People, they might not even understand. It's just like the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. You know, that saying is real. It's very real. Uh, and if people, you know, their parents had uh, substance abuse issues and uh, were just, uh, you know, uh, not a, a great citizen, those things can come back around you know, and inevitably impact that, that kid later in life. And sometimes they don't even know it or if they're abusive or whatever. It's funny how, you know, abusive parents, then sometimes their kids will then also have at least to deal with the challenge with, uh, being abusive themselves. So yeah, it's important. So, and self-awareness is like the, it's one of the most difficult processes to yeah. achieve like and there's people who go from birth to death who never achieve it i think that's probably the majority because it's mm-hmm. really hard to look in the mirror and be like okay you're screwed up in this area this area and this area and everything that you thought was maybe wrong with person a b and c actually you were the problem yeah. in all those situations most people can't do that because right. it, it ego is a damaged hurt thing yeah and it's hard to repair it if you hurt it that was uh that was one of the big pieces that helped me that that consulting firm that I worked with called the flipping group in college station, uh, after I got out of the oil field, um, that's what they focused on. They, they were executive coaches, uh, business coaches for, you know, anything from fortune 500 companies down to startups, down to individual athletes, um, and, and how to performance coach them into a better place. And it started with self-awareness. You like you would take a profile based off of, um, six people that were in your circle, maybe peers of yours, maybe family members of yours, maybe a boss, maybe somebody that is under you in your organization. 
and those people put in anonymous feedback uh, and, and, and then it spits out saying, hey, well, here's where top performers are on a scale of one to 10 and all these different, well, there's uh, really 36 different scales that they would measure. And here's where you are in, in relation to where these top performers are, right? And so then you would all automatically start to trying to decipher, oh my gosh, I'm so say on a, on a, uh, say on a self-motivated scale, right? The need for achievement. If a lot of us, you know, myself on a need for achievement, I'm, I'm self-motivated, very goal oriented, and I'm, I'm on 11 on a scale of one to 10, right? But some people they're, they're much lower on that scale or a need, you know, uh, how nurturing are you in a, in a work climate, right? Do you take care of and empower the people that work for you, work with you? And a lot of times that's what bosses would find out about themselves and they weren't self-aware as their employees would rate them and say, yeah, you're like a, on a four or five on a, on a nurturing scale. And that boss is like, oh my gosh, I didn't, I was so busy getting promoted and getting the job done and making money that I didn't realize that my people don't think I take care of them at all. You know, and time after time, we, we would see that these guys are running Fortune 500 companies. They didn't understand how their people, their team saw them until we exposed it on, a, on an anonymous profile. And so, you know, self-awareness is, is the key to being able to unlock, you know, a higher level of performance, a higher level of communication, you know, and, and to be a better team player, to be a better leader, to be a better, you know, father, husband, uh, whatever it is, is being self-aware and being honest and humble about where you're at and what you can improve on, right? What What are your constraints behaviorally that hold you back and how can you improve those and, and, and be a better team player and bring more to the table? So that, that company working there uh, with the flipping group really uh, opened my mind a lot to, to what my constraints were and how I could um, bring more to the table. So, yeah, I mean, that's, it's, it's one of the hardest things to do and, and going through like your process that you went through, right? Like you were, you grew up on the ranch, you did this yeah. and then, you know, you went to West Point. What, what was it? I, I know I keep bouncing us back, yeah. but I just think there's some good stuff maybe we could get from some of that. <laughs> For sure. Cause it's not like, it's not something that most people know anything about. Yeah. Right. And most of the people who would listen to the show have a, a background similar to yours. Or right. They don't really have, I mean, we've got a lot of military personnel sure. on this show from all over the world, Yeah, all over the country. World's a little... That's a big, sure. big word. They've been people, all over the world. Got people in Ukraine listening tonight. Shout out to those folks. Actually, we do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Did you see, guys, we got the Google review from the lady in Britain. She's like, oh, this is the best thing ever. That's a terrible <laughs> British accent. I don't know why I did that. I'm really embarrassed. That's You're all right. right. So I, that's can't, self-awareness I can't do a British too, accent that. either, so don't worry about it. I can't do any accents I stick good. with Australian, and that's about it, man. I watched Crocodile Dundee growing up. So That, that was... That was the shit. Excuse my language. <laughs> Crocodile Dundee was next. If you were like seven or eight watching oh, Crocodile Dundee, it's like, change your life. where's my leather jacket and my alligator hat? I'm, I'm going to go screw some gators up. I'm going to dynamite some fish in the lake today. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah and uh, right in the middle of New York. Yeah, like, exactly. No one questions that. It's like, oh, it's fine, Dundee. NYPD. You're Crocodile Dundee. It's never fine. forgot it. Yeah, I saw it when I was seven. Yeah. yeah. You didn't try it, right? Yeah. No, uh, you wouldn't be no, here talking No, of course not. No. Uh, <laughs> Self-awareness. Don't right. try that. <laughs> But coming from your small town, going in there, I mean, what was like the first, and even if you p- played like uh, D3 football or whatever, yeah. or uh, 3A football, like mm-hmm. stepping up to, you know, army level football, yeah. I mean, that's a, that's a big jump. Yeah. Um, you know, there's, you, you, you learn uh, hindsight's twenty twenty, and you learn, you know, the seasons of life are co- going by fast. And so it's funny how, how much, I don't know if you've ever seen a movie, uh, my, you know, Ashton Kutcher was in it, a couple other people. But it's called Butterfly Effect. Effects. Yeah, did you ever see that? Yeah, the movie's it's really creepy, almost. Yeah. right? But the concept is there: is that such small interactions in your life, small actions, decisions can change the trajectory of your life and put you in a completely different place. And so, man, I've had so many um, situations like that in my life, and you know, one of those was, you know, say the homeschooling thing, right? I I chose. My parents, um, I went back in as a fifth grader, right? I'm like, what am I, 10, 11 years old? And it's funny to think about how young that is. And my parents, I remember having the discussion, say, hey, do you want to keep homeschooling or do you want to stay in public school? What do you, what do you think? How'd that year go, you know? And, uh, and so that was really when I, had, I, was, I was working on a horse ranch every day uh, at the neighbors at uh, Derwood Kelly's. And uh, I was 11 years old, man. I loved it. 
fell in love with it. And my parents like kind of let me choose. And I said, I'm going to go homeschool because I'm, I'm done with my classes every day by noon. I can go over and start, you know, uh, get to the ranch and start working over there. And, uh, and that's what I wanted to do. Right. And so that was a choice I made as a, as 11 year old with my parents, you know? And so I did that for the next three years. And so I didn't play football or anything, um, through junior high, through my freshman year. And then about sophomore year in high school, I said, man, I kind of want to play football. You know, I hadn't been doing it. And so I just went back into public school. That's what I had to do to play football. And so I was playing catch up, right? I was like, oh man, I, don't, I didn't really know what I was doing. I'd played peewee, you know? And so I missed three or four very fundamental years of learning football acumen. And so I went in and, you know, I acclimated quickly and caught up to some extent, but there was still a certain piece of the game that I didn't understand uh, fast enough. And so then that impl implicates where you get, who you get recruited by, right? Um, and so, you know, I had buddies that were getting full rides from, you know, Oklahoma, Georgia, UT, A&M, all these different you know, schools. And they were the coach's son, you know, they had been playing football since they were five and six years old. Um, and so that right there, then I was like, oh, well, Army West Point calls. Everybody knows Army's like, you know, uh, they're division one, but they, yeah, they're not, they're not very good. They suck. So, uh, football has been a challenge for army football for a long time. And, and so, but at the same time I had, you know, that opportunity to go take a scholarship there. And so I went and did the visit and I was like, yeah, that's where I'm going to go to school. And that's where I ended up. And so it was different than say, if I went to, I could have played at TCU or, um, I could have walked on probably to A&M and, and UT and those things, but that was, that was a choice, right? It shows. And in my life, you know, because of that one choice, uh, I'm in New York for four years. Don't see my family ever, you know, once a year for Christmas, uh, I'm wearing a, a, a military uniform doing push-ups, And then I end up in Afghanistan, you know, <laughs> on the fifth year. I'm like, geez, that really escalated quickly. You know, it's like, I ended up in a place that I never thought I would be. And, um, Do you feel like you kind of lost control of your life because of the way that they, they operate there. What's that Afghanistan or well, no, I mean, just the, mil the, the whole military, the military thing. academy. Yeah. Um, Man, I, I, uh, you lose, you lose control of like that decision of any, any day you can choose many times in life. Like I want to move, I'm going to, I want to move to a new city. I want to start a new career. I want to go somewhere else. And in the military you're in like whatever your oath of commitment was, uh, you're, you're there. So for me, um, graduating from West Point, then I had five years of a of commitment to be an army officer after. And so there was no, you know, changing my mind about that. I had to go at least those five years and then choose from there if I wanted to stay or not. And so Afghanistan was inevitable because um, that was all post 9-11 and, and we knew where we were going to be and what we were going to be doing as soon as we graduated from uh, the academy. And so, um, yeah, I mean, I, you just come to a certain point where you're like, I'm going to embrace this. I, I'm here for a purpose. I'm here for a reason. And, uh, and, and, and then you're 22, 23 years old and you're, you know, leading, leading troops in, in combat in, in Afghanistan. And, and that's, that's where I spent a year of my life, you know, and, uh, you know, that, that year, um, you know, one perspective is say, well, I'll never get that back. And then another perspective says, well, that year was, uh, instrumental in, in, in making me who I am, you know, and making me appreciate the rest of my life and appreciate the blessings that I have. Um, you know, it, it made me appreciate being what a, an American is like those type of things of my nationalism and my sense of liberty and freedom and everything that we stand for as a country, it, it centered me on all that. Right. And so, although it was a challenge also, although it was, you know, maybe not at certain points in my life ideal, it was great. And, and I'll, and I'll never, um, look back on that and never regret it. I, I appreciate it. And I'm so glad and thankful that I got to, to serve and do that, you know, so small decisions have big implications. So, yeah. And when, when you finished your, you know, you're acquired a lot of time in the army. I mean, what was, yeah. what was that point? Cause you had mentioned earlier that, Hey, you know, I, I could have went to be a, a higher level officer all the way up to general. Cause there's very uh, linear paths for that sort right. of thing, especially if you come out as a graduate and an officer, mm -hmm. like they groom you to go down those paths. Right. They want you to, right. Cause yep. you've constantly got to refill those boots as people, you know, leave. Right. Why did you decide not to? Yeah. You know, for me, it was, uh, my, my last assignment before I got out was in El Paso, Texas. 
And uh, I was working with a lot of senior level folks and we were um, training and preparing National Guard and reserve units all around the country. They would come to um, El Paso and basically do a dress rehearsal before they went to Guantanamo Bay, uh, Bagram Air Force Base and different places around the world. And so we were training them and, and I got a lot of exposure to general officers and colonels and those guys that had spent 30 years in the military. And I, you know, I, I got to talk with them, visit with them and, and see, you know, what their perspective was. And it just, you know, for me, um, a lot of people, you know, think that the army is what the army is. And there's, you know, there's a narrow pathway of, of different types of careers and experiences that you might have. And the army is very broad. You can have your career path and your day to day experience, uh, can vary a lot, you know, depending on what you're doing. Some people, they end up in and some type of cubicle desk job that is basically the same thing that they're, they could have done in the civilian world. And it's, it's not rewarding and it's not uh, challenging and those type of things. And some people are made for that, right? Everybody's made for something. But um, so the army goes anything from a desk job to uh, you can, you can be, you know, as a officer, you're basically a manager of whatever branch of the, the army that you're in. If it's you know, a manager of a lot of truck drivers, a manager of pilots of helicopters, or a manager of infantry soldiers, whatever it is, you're managing and leading those soldiers. And so, um, albeit I love the leadership piece, I was just ready to see, uh, I was ready to see some other things. And I, I wanted to experience the full effect of being able to make life choices and, and career choices and try something else, you know? And, uh, so I, you know, I did those five years. Um, they were great years. I uh, worked with great Americans, and I appreciate that time. But then it was just for me. It was like it just it clocked out. I was like, all right, I'm ready to go try something else, you know. And uh, and so I don't regret that decision either. It's been good um, because I've gotten to experience so many other things since then um, that would have been, um, you know, not not available for me to do otherwise. So, yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, I make it makes sense. And you talk to military personnel, different branches, different, different, whatever, and they, yeah. they always have a different answer. It's it's interesting. Everybody's experience, even though the military is this very regiment specific thing and always has been, right? Especially the army, it is one way, really. Mm-hmm. Um, and when they say army of one, I mean they fucking, you know. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, everyone always comes out with a different experience. Some yeah. people are really disenfranchised with the whole thing, and other sure. people come out you know, feeling more American than ever. Yeah. Was there anything that you, that bothered you about your time in, in the army? Were there certain things that um, upset you maybe? Cause if you were an officer, I mean, you were exposed to more things yeah. than, you know, everyday Americans get to hear about. Yeah. You know, I think the challenge that they face is um, probably on the HR side of things and being able to be flexible um, and let these young men and women take a career that most fits them within the army um you know they they they, they're tasked with a responsibility um to fill certain slots across the army right it's a number it's a it's a whole uh pyramid of like hey we got to fill in this branch got to fill in this post got to fill in this um this unit and and so i get that um but then also you've got a lot of great young americans that are committing their life to service and you know if they could put more of a budget toward career counselors and say personally it's or it's a one-on-one type of decision and say from the day they begin being a lieutenant all the way through not just when they're a colonel or a, a general and congress has to you know decide if you're going to get a second star or not but like when they're young um give them attention and give them intentionality kind of like i talked about earlier about where what they want to do and what their goals are to be in the military because then you know i think that would alleviate a lot of retention issues because i think a lot of young officers they get disgruntled with they end up in some some career path that hr kept putting them in putting them in putting them in and it wasn't fulfilling to them wasn't challenging and probably wasn't what they were most fit to do in the first place and it's just because there's such a big volume and a lot of uh volatility in 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 turnover in that um you know task that is filling all these empty spots in the military so um that would have helped i think retention a lot with you know the, all my peers is really what i have to to gauge that off of and the feedback there it was always these guys were disgruntled about 
where they ended up, what what branch they were in, those type of things. Is if, if they could have had a better experience and didn't gotten into a different career path, they might have stayed longer. So anyway, it's interesting and, and it's really upsetting. Like if you spend much time looking in the military or, or, or any type of political, like anything politically deep, and you start yeah. realizing. <clears throat> Like if you if you've ever been as diligent as to want to like read one spending bill, unfortunately yeah. I'm that psycho <laughs> and I've done it and and yeah. you see how little money it would take to be able to do what you're talking about sure. in every branch of the military. Like I mean you're talking these politicians will spend billions of dollars on things that don't make sense. Yeah. This current bill that's up, we won't even talk about it, but you know it's 4.2 trillion, mm-hmm. said it was 3.5, it's actually not. Right. But there's millions and millions and even billions of dollars being spent on some of the silliest shit you have ever yeah. heard of. Yeah. None of it's for public outreach. None right. of it's to fix the homeless crisis. None of it's to improve anything in the military mm-hmm. or the VA. They, there's like a hundred million dollars for like study of like desert fish. Yeah, exactly. Taxpayer, taxpayer money that should, that could go. Yeah. You, you take a hundred million dollars or whatever the amount is. It's probably, I think it's right. less like 50 million. Right. Even, even $50 million injected into say one of the smaller branches of the military mm-hmm. start there and, and do that. I mean, what would you need to start? How many enlisted army men are there right now? Over like 1.2 million or something like that. Yeah. Uh, well, all, all right? the, all the forces together. Yeah. Army is probably around 400,000 yeah. right now. Yeah. Yeah. And the all whole armed forces is like yeah. 1.2, 1.3 million yeah. or yeah. something. Right. So I mean, a hundred million dollars, I think that would fix the entire issue with what you're talking yeah. about. Yeah. You could, you could hire a lot of HR folks to help, you know, c- counsel these guys to a career for sure. Yeah, get, ri- get rid of a few high-paid city planners that mm-hmm. really don't serve anything, like we were talking about with the commercial stuff. And, yeah. and you could do all this stuff, and then and then maybe you would incentivize more military personnel to enter politics, which right. I think would fix a lot of the political issues. You've yeah. got all these. I don't want to go too deep down this. Uh, let's go. I don't care. Yeah, but, you know, pander to our audience a lot because <laughs> that's our people, right? Like, they get what I'm saying. Yeah. But uh, if you were to have more military personnel who actually really know what's going on right involved like look at some of the really successful politicians you know the, the governor DeSantis and mm-hmm. uh dan crenshaw down here both seals both savages yeah yeah killing it in the political game because they have this just mental understanding of what's going on in the world and right here that someone who came up through yale mm-hmm. went directly into a city planner position and then into the senate they don't yeah. know jack shit about yeah. the world no, and it true. shows absolutely yeah it's becoming more and more obvious and you know as much angst as i have sometimes when i when i see um those folks with the socialist agendas that continue to get more exposure and more of a platform well, I'm like, it's also exposing them and exposing the weakness that they have, you know, in, in their theory and in, in, uh, in their underlying um, overall just worldview is, is not what it needs to be to run a um, capitalist society that we've built this um, this country on, you know. And so, uh, you know, that's that's the good and the bad. So. The bad is, is that, you know, there's so much of that that's running the country right now. But the good is, is that we're, we're seeing guys like Ron DeSantis and, and Dan Crenshaw and folks like that, um, Charlie Kirk, that are coming to the surface uh, and rising to the challenge of taking on uh, critical theory and those type of things, right? Well, absolutely. So, um, you know, I, I, I love, what I love about Americans is overall our resilience is second to none and i think that's what the um i guess the hope of america is is how resilient the american dream is right and so when we're faced with wars when we're faced like it was on display in our generation for say 9 11 right so at right after 9 11 happened and, I, and i'm not saying that that was good right but the 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 light at the end of the tunnel is when americans are attacked as a whole we're resilient and we come together and we continue to fight for our fundamental freedoms. Right. And all the, all the basic, uh, you know, you know, the, the distractions of, of what's in this bill and what's in that bill and, and global warming and all these other things that are on the peripheral, those things start to fade away and we get back to the core fundamentals of what makes America great. And so, um, I think that we're in a phase right now where, 
it is very device divided, um, but you've you've got the resilient uh, resurgence of America that is is boiling and it, and it's boiling to the surface and and it's going to uh, it's going to overcome and and it's going to come back and um, I'm excited about that. Now I am too. Near term, we've got we've got a lot of hurdles in front of us, right? And we know what those are. We're presented with those every single day. Um, and it's, and, but now I think it's, it's people are realizing at a deeper level what the root causes of these issues that we're dealing with over, say, the last nine months, for instance, right? All these issues that are coming up that we see on the, in, the, in, the, in the news media every day, what we know what the root cause of those is now. And it's getting less and less ambiguous what that cause is. And, and the need for resilient, uh, freedom centered Americans is, 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 is higher than ever. And, and they're stepping up. And so I'm, I'm excited about that, that movement that is happening right now. Well, and we're, we're seeing it in, in some really key areas and, and, and the point of focus, it isn't on the already converted, right. Right. Or the really tiny minority of this, this insanely progressive full on socialist left position sure. that sure. people don't realize how small that is right like there's it's the middle people that are the most important and mm -hmm. those are the people right now who are changing i mean there's some really great statistics out again it doesn't matter if your political views are these are just facts you can pull them right off the internet. right when you see a network like say cnn for yeah. instance they're, they're just a propaganda pusher they're not news anymore they don't right. even, they don't talk about news their, their biggest source of ratings is talking about donald trump now yeah and it exactly. has been since like he was the best thing that ever happened to cnn <laughs> yeah right their ratings were never higher than 2016 through 2019 right now they go the entire month of october without right. having a single program on their network hitting a million yeah, views exactly that, I mean, that tells you that. all you need to know mm -hmm. like most people they don't want all that propaganda. They don't, and they don't trust. They don't trust it anyway. Right, right. They may not be full on red blooded Americans like mm -hmm. like a lot of these people that you know you had mentioned are, which is fine. You don't have to be, but your gray, your gray area people, not your white, not your black right. area, not color. Obviously, mm -hmm. you have to say that now. Right, but your your middle ground people. They're not tolerating it. Now you're even seeing in Hollywood with rappers. Like yeah. they're not taking the woke agenda. This this Dave Chappelle where he's just like, You can't cancel me. It's right. It's freaking amazing. Yeah. Like that's what we need. We need these people of influence to step up and be like, This shit is ridiculous. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what's happening. And it's happening faster than I thought it would. Yeah, it is. Yeah. And you know, these folks in the entertainment industry, right? Um, they've complied uh to that that woke agenda for a long time. And it's finally coming to a head, you know, and, and, and you've got folks that were maybe on the fence or they were maybe, uh, you know, under the table, people didn't really realize where they stood. And now it's, it's, it's coming to the surface. Um, just like you said, Dave Chappelle and, and even who was it the other day that was like, uh, it was, uh, was it Nicki Minaj? It's Nicki Minaj. Yeah. And yeah, she just she went on the out, rant. She went, she spoke out against the vaccine. Now she didn't say don't get the vaccine. She was like, do your own research. Yeah, exactly. And that's all she had to say to be, you know, well, the, the mob attempted to swallow her up. But you're right. not going to swallow up Nicki Minaj. You're no. damn sure not going to swallow up the most successful comedian in the world. Yeah, exactly. It's just not going to happen. It, as long as they say no, you can't do anything. Right. Like, that's the whole thing with this whole cancel culture thing that I don't know if people realize. You're only canceled if you let them cancel you. Right, exactly. Like, there's a place for you. There's a lot of way more people who want you around doing what you're doing than this tiny sliver of a population who doesn't. Yeah. You just have to say no. And exactly. we're seeing it. Dave Chappelle said no. Nicki Minaj said no. She doubled, tripled down on her statements almost. Actually, it really did triple down on her yeah. statements. It's like, 100%. Well, there's nothing they can say. Right. She's and got more influence than the entire network at CNN. Yeah, exactly. And so we're seeing these folks with influence. Finally, you know, the, the lines are being drawn in the sand. And I think that that's a great thing. It's a positive thing for for the country um yeah it's going to be interesting how far this propaganda goes because you know it's almost like propaganda is world war three you know what i'm saying um because it is a point of contention that is it's it's under it's underlying the under the surface people don't understand that you know people talk about oh is it nuclear what is world war three look like will it happen 
And I think that we're we're kind of in it. It's information war, right? When Absolutely. when when the history books are written, it's going to be you know twenty twenty through twenty thirty. It was an inf- full on information war because we've fully vested and matured the life cycle of uh, major news media, and they've gone to the point of you know they're fully a a slave to ratings and, and 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 they'll say and do anything to get more ratings right and even and then what even bothers me right even is, is these folks that you know even like we say the conservative news uh, outlets like fox or it's whatever the same. they still are running for ratings and it really bothers me even this this most recent one's a good example of this thing with uh sensationalism is this gabby petito thing right yep um sad story we hate i hate that it happened um those things happen Every day. Every day. But they found an outlet and a story and narrative that had an immediate Netflix effect for them to report that news every day. And so then you, it just starts giving such a bad taste in my mouth when I'm just seeing them report this, report that, clickbait here, clickbait there. And I'm like, man, y'all are running this into the ground. It's it's a terrible tragedy that it happened. But the way that you're handling it and, and you're selling yourself just to get more clicks on your website to make more money for your executives and your bonuses at the end of the year, that bothers me, right? And, yeah, and, and that's and that's the good guys that yeah. are doing that, right? Well, and it's so, happening on the other side of the fence. Exactly. And it actually doesn't even matter who you think the good guy is. Somebody's probably listening to this like, fuck Fox News. Yeah, Tucker exactly. Carlson is the, is the devil. Mm-hmm. But actually, he's really funny. I actually like him a lot. <laughs> but uh, Yeah, he's still a piece of shit. Yeah, so Ty... Don Lemon's a great guy. See, I'm going to flip it on you. Yeah. See, we're coming at you with love. Don, I'm just Don saying, Don Tucker Carlson is still a piece of shit. All right. Oh, just man. What would you do if you saw Don Lemon in the street? <laughs> yeah. Hug what him. would you say? I, I would hug him what and say, Jesus say? loves you, son. Uh, Joe Rogan's going to break your neck, but Jesus loves Don, you. Don, you need Jesus, brother. Yeah. Either way, but so back to what we were saying before Ty slowly injected his opinion of Tucker Carlson, <laughs> who, regardless of what you say, is way more successful than Don Lemon. Yeah. Yeah. Don Lemon shot himself in the foot. Well, he does. He believes in gun control, so I, I don't know. <laughs> Stomped his own foot? I don't really know. But uh, Stabbed himself in the foot. And <laughs> Tucker Carlson sports uh, fascists. Okay. Okay, yeah, here we go. Do right. you want to go here? Uh, that's I about enough of that. I, I think sometimes you forget whose program just, you're producing, Ty. I'm just saying he supported a fascist Hungary, Hungarian uh, Im- empire. So. Oh, okay. The yeah. Hungarians. Yeah. Not the Hungarians of whatever, Hungary. Yeah, he, he also supported the Turks. Yeah, back in Gangnam. No, it's Turk. Never mind. It wasn't Hungary. Yeah. It's Turks. Yeah. <laughs> Which is still a fascist ruled country. Okay. Anyway, yeah, I, ha- I was about to say something so groundbreaking that was going to break the internet, like in the best of ways. Uh, all and, me- you, and you were going to jump on board, and it was going to be this thing. But I'm really mad at Tucker now. <laughs> no, not t- you know what I don't like about Tucker, though, Ty? I will give you that. Is it's time to get a new hairdo. Like yeah, I will give man. you that. What's he needs that? a better haircut. Yeah, man. It's got the old Miss haircut. He man. just I- does. Like, dude, it could be better. Just go in so there and I get could- you a get you a medium fade, man. Get- Get with the times. Just go to Supercuts. Get you a little medium fade, hard part, and call it good, man. Yeah, two on the side, swoop to the left, a little <laughs> bit of pomade, you're good to go, bro. <laughs> is, he like, look better. The, is he still wearing the bow ties? Uh, no, uh, that, I don't haven't seen that, it, but he, not Tucker Carlson, the haircut is a bow tie haircut. It, you know? it is. Yeah. I will give him that. Like All he needs is a, a monocle and a handlebar mustache, <laughs> and we're back in 1845, man. Uh, but, but still, all right, Tucker, I, yeah, we're. I, I think we'd be buds. I think you know so. what I'm saying? Yeah, just overall, just I, I don't. Funny. Yeah, overall, I, I don't like his his narr- his 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 rhetoric. I, I like Tucker. I do. I I like his sense of humor most of all, and I think that is one of the most important things that like you just can't allow people to be funny anymore right. for the sake of being funny. Like if he says something ridiculous and you know it has something to do with the Turkish Empire, right? You know those dang Turks, <laughs> but. <laughs> I actually want to go to Istanbul. Have you ever been to Turkey? I've never. Uh, been to Turkey. No, actually, yeah. I never have. Yeah, sounds. I mean, yeah. Why not? My question for you, Chance, just since we're on this topic, you told me before that because far you've so, told me that Fox News is too too far to the right in terms of tribalism. Then, uh, so both both are yeah. So if you want, my whole thing is you have got to capture the middle ground. Yeah, right. Like sure. that, those are the people that really can in. in invoke the most change right now there's way more right now like true right sure and there is socialist left and i don't think people realize that most of your liberal people are, are in the middle mm-hmm. which is okay because if you look at classic liberalism it wasn't a bad thing right like like yeah. jfk he may have made some weird decisions but that that was a he was 
the most one of the most popular presidents ever because of his approach, and it was a liberal approach. And back in the sixties, it, it made sense. Yeah, right. Even even Bill Clinton, regardless of what you what you think about him and the Monica Lewinsky thing, and he was so charismatic, no one even cared. Which right. That's that's a that's a one up for him. Right. It all went down when he got on Jeffrey Epstein's jet. That's a, oh, that's a yeah. bad thing. But that people was people he was so good with people that, that you were able to forgive the entire cheating on his wife thing because like yeah. well, does it really matter because it's bill clinton right? sure. he's so charismatic that it's great and, and he was able to do certain things as a democratic president mm -hmm. that like this current administration just could never do yeah right you he could appeal to enough people on the right that like everybody more or less worked together and he did some real fucked up things Don't yeah for wrong. sure for sure but liberalism by its classic definition, doesn't exist in mm -hmm. this current. Like, it's all socialism. Yeah. It's not even democratic socialism, right? right? It's just spend everything, increase the taxes, hand the rest of it out. Right. And the only reason they want it's not because they care. And I yeah. think that's the... But that's also the misconception by conservatives, though. That's... It's you... You have a you specifically have a very pessimistic viewpoint of politics. And I don't blame you on that. But that viewpoint is just a very pessimistic view of... I can essentially say that say the same thing about conservatives. You can oh, say that absolutely. you can say and that I have said that about conservatives. You can say that you can say that liberals that oh they just want to they don't want to help people they're only they're only uh self-interested. I can say the same thing about conservatives. That's just I'm just saying that specific ones, yeah. I'm mm -hmm. not a pure liberal, but I understand the different viewpoints of both sides. Liberalism is supposed to be trying to help social social issues specifically. Actually, it's it's so liberalism was formed to support and bolster up the working class. It was the liberal agendas that created the unions for workers, right. which ended up being a disaster, but that's gone. So no matter what you say, the working class Americans are now supported by the right. Like the, the, the not left. Not really the, though. That's huh? yeah, really, not like, really. It's so you are against unions yet. We have not raised. I didn't say I was against. Well, unions. no, no, I'm not saying you specifically. I'm saying conservatives, my, my bad, but we've not re we've not raised the minimum wage in over 20 years. Um, conservatives are in much in as much as de as much as Democrats are are very much into the pocket of co corporations too, and they are self interested in the corporations and oil companies and all of that. As as much as you want to say that Democrats are oh they don't want to help people, conservatives are not for the help for the working people either. They took a ta they did a corporate ta not a corporate tax cut. They took a whole tax cut for rich people across this nation again in Trump's term. So it's not exactly. They're not exactly helping the working hey, class. Hey, Ty, hold on one second. I'm just going to give you one piece of advice, and then we're going to get back to talking to Luke because, unfortunately, you grabbed the microphone a little too hard on this one, um, which is fine. You're entitled to your opinions. I fully support your right to say what you want to say, which is one of the key differences b between the the moderate right and you know the, the staunch left people is I might not agree with everything you're saying, but I agree with your right to be able to say it, even though you've taken the microphone and captured it on my own program. I still support your right to say it. The liberal left, and you can disagree with this, they do not support my right to express what I want to say. They want to cancel that. They don't want it to be on Facebook. The reason Facebook's getting blasted right now so much by the, by the left is because they're allowing conservatives a platform to say what they want to say, and they want to quiet people, which is the problem. It's not your moderate liberals that, that are the issue. It's this far left agenda that wants to silence people who disagree. But then mm -hmm. why does the right keep yelling at fa about Facebook uh, for banning them when that's not the case, when Ben Shapiro is the most successful person on Facebook right now? Sure, and Ben Shapiro will be the first person to tell you that he actually supports Mark Zuckerberg, Zuckerberg's approach to that. Facebook's because always so allowed successful. a platform. Yeah, and he'll be the first one to say that. But I anyway... That was a lot, but uh, <laughs> it's still important to say that because that, that, uh, that proves a whole point, right? right? Just that whole transaction proves yeah. the whole point. It doesn't matter if you agree with somebody, you should be able to say whatever you want. This is the freest country in the world and right. really, really and truly you can go to the North or South border and you're not allowed to say whatever you want. That's how yeah. close it is to us. Right. And I think a lot of people, young people take for granted how important that is. And Ty, just so you're aware about the tax cuts from Trump, that benefited my companies so much that we were able to add 
new positions, mm-hmm. right? It put us into a lower tax bracket. Yeah. And, and that's small business. That's not corporation. At, at that time, we were talking 10 employees total for an entire company. It allowed us to add an additional five right. employees. And then it put us into a different bracket where we could, we could offer health insurance. So it sure. was actually a good thing. And when people say don't tax or don't give corporations tax breaks, that's completely insane. Because if you, if they're paying, and I think the answer to everything's flat tax person, yeah. everybody plays a, like let's go the tithe principle right a flat 10 percent. right if you're a billion dollar company and you're paying 10 percent, you're you're paying in so much more than somebody than a teacher who's making thirty five thousand yeah, exactly. dollars paying for her 10 percent. right and everybody's benefiting i'm a right. i'm a supporter it's of proportional flat tax yeah it's fair well and you, it, it's gotten so many decades into this that it gets complicated right it's so convoluted this bracket that bracket this break there's loopholes all these different things and, and that starts to be the only way that people can reasonably talk about it and say, well, what can it proportionally reasonably be? Because, yeah, if you don't do the flat tax, there's, there's loopholes, right? That's why, that's why these, the more money you have, the more uh, motivation you have to try to keep that and retain that, the more ability you have to hire more accountants to find loopholes and run it through other companies and show losses and do those things. And so really what you're doing is letting these people that have the most money anyway, avoid and skirt the the tax bracket that you put them in. The higher you put the tax bracket, the more they're going to skirt it. Absolutely. And the guy who's going H&R Block making $30,000 a year is getting screwed the most. He is. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, he's so. absolutely getting screwed the most. And, and I think that's just one of the fundamental things that people don't know unless they spend time in business. Yeah. Like, you, you can't just say these buzzwords that you hear on TV or you read on Twitter or Snopes. Yeah. Like, you just can't do that, especially if you don't have any fundamental understanding of taxes. Right, right. Right? Like, getting a tax break, going from one bracket to the next as a business afford you opportunity it doesn't go in the pocket you reinvest that right like if i get a tax break i'm not pulling that money and stuffing it in my pocket and exactly. going buying a, a new house exactly no it's getting forwarded into the next year to uh buy more materials buy better equipment hire more people it's it's getting redistributed right. that's the definition of wealth redistribution a tax break to a company small or large unless it's some kind of a psycho bernie madoff type character yeah what they're doing is that company's reinvesting to add more jobs to then create more revenue that then creates more jobs. Like it's, that's how economies are built. Yeah. And it's the short sighted little thing. It's like, well, you got to tax the corporations. Actually, if, if I'll use myself as an example, or maybe you're, I don't know how many employees you have, but if you've got a bunch of them and you go into another tax bracket and you have to pay more, let's say it's 10% more. Right. And you're a $5 million company. You have to pay 10% more tax. Right. It's insane. With that is three employees who are making thirty dollars an hour, right? Yeah. Plus their benefits that you would have to cut because exactly. unless your revenue goes up, which it's not going to, mm-hmm. there's no way. Unless your revenue goes up and then it balances that out, which it won't, because then you'll just be cut more on a higher higher dividend. Exactly, you're going to have to make cuts somewhere. Yeah, no, that's exactly the, right. Companies are no different than personal. Ty, I saw you doing your budget, your personal budget. If me is, and I'm just going to say this because it applies. If me, I go, hey, Ty, I know we agreed that you would make this amount, but I think I'm going to have to cut you. And I don't think you should make that much money. And I'm saying, I have this fee that I need to charge you. Cause right. I, I'm, I'm against high taxes for everybody. Sure. Like if you're at a certain point, let's say you make less than 30,000 bucks a year. I don't think you should even pay taxes. Right. Because your contribution is so minor that's right. not going to make a difference. But if you're Coca-Cola, right. let's say a, a pure U.S.-based company, Pick one, doesn't matter, Ford right. Motor Company. Sh- should you have to pay 40% taxes because you're so successful? You employ hundreds of thousands of people. Like right. that money that you're saving is not going into the CEO's pocket. And yeah. the CEO should make a lot of money because there's no more stressful position and there's more pressure. If things fall apart at Ford, the first person they fire is their CEO. Yeah, exactly. Fact. So, yeah, that's a high pressure, high stress job. And he's working 23 hours a freaking day. Right. The guy running the screw guns working seven. Right. Right. And he's 100%. still making a good living, but he, the company is getting a tax break. And then all they're doing is redistrib- redistributing that wealth. Right. From the top down. That's yeah. what happens with tax breaks. That's what happens when companies get more money. Yeah. There's more incentive to hire more people. Yeah. Or give people bonuses. If we have a really profitable year, like at the other business, yeah. do you know what we do? We give out Christmas bonuses. We right. don't pocket the money. Right. 
right? Like, and most companies do that. Right. Or they'll, or they'll set up corporate events or they'll do things for their people because right. the number one thing when you're employing is to retain your people. You don't exactly. want to have to refill those positions. Exactly. And that's the problem. Some of these people on the left, they see tax breaks coming from a business guy and I have my beefs with Trump. Like, right, dude, right. Shut sure. your mouth. Get off yeah. Twitter. Like, you Out know, of like, control. The best thing they could have done for you is ban you in 2016 and you'd still be president. Yeah, but, exactly. You know, and people would love you because you right. just said the wrong things. But he did a lot of good yep. as far as policy goes. His mouth makes no sense to me. Right. You have more self-control than Way, that. Just like you said, yeah. you, you need to look in the freaking mirror. Self-awareness. You need self-awareness. Yeah. He didn't have it. But <laughs> the kind of business approach that he took to setting up the economy. Right. Had inflation at its lowest, gas right. prices at its lowest. We had a full oil reserve. We weren't. We were not relying on any oil from outside companies yeah. within the first three years of his presidency. He exactly. got that done, and that's like you may not like Trump. Uh, I definitely didn't. Like I, there was other people I would have rather had be president. I'm sure yeah. you would have as yeah, well, for sure. But that business mindset because he did take advantage of the loopholes mm-hmm. and the taxes, and he's first one to say it. And you know, he did some stuff in his personal life that I don't agree with. Right. Sure. But. If you look at it from that standpoint yeah. and you apply that to the country, there, there was a reason that before COVID, this country was sitting the best it ever had yeah, exactly. in a long time. Like yeah. just from a fiscal perspective only. Right. Right. That's all I'm talking about is from an economical standpoint. The rest of it, yeah, kind of a mess because he was kind of crazy. Right. But from an economical standpoint, it was really good. Right. And if you were in business or doing things like you, you saw the, ex- the direct results of that. Right. Like just the fuel prices being low. Like if you were, if you're running trucks or equipment or doing anything like that and you're filling gas and diesel mm-hmm. in the thousands every month, sure. the difference between a dollar 50 gas and three fifty gas right. yeah. at the end of a tax year. Yeah. Holy crap. You're yeah. talking it's a lot. thousands of dollars. Mm-hmm. So it's a big deal. Yeah. But like gas prices currently are not, Due to presidential politics, it's due from de- just like we always hear at complete trailers, which is de- uh, supply and demand. The supply line is messed up. That same thing is happening with the oils. Not yeah, ex- but there's certain things like shutting down the Keystone Pipeline that caused that. But that was also never that was never up though. No, but it could have been, and it would have it would have made us more reliant on ourselves. Well, so that's it, one thing that that changed is we went from relying on. We had our we, we were a hundred percent self sufficient in in, right. the, in the fuel sector one hundred percent, and now we're begging Saudi Arabia to give us oil like yeah, that's a problem yeah, to me. exactly, so. yeah self self reliance is I think a long term goal that we always need to continue to work at and uh, it we're, we're we're showing this this dependence on you know energy dependence on Saudi Arabia you know. Uh, goods and retail dependence on China, like there, we have so much dependence on China from these uh, uh, these semiconductors, these chips. I mean, everything, every all our retail products, everything we have is is consumer products are dependent upon China and the supply chain situation. Um, I'm I'm a big proponent of trying to add American jobs at every point along the way. You know, the big theory based difference for me between the socialist agenda and it's it's a little bit weird between i feel like people talk about socialism and liberalism almost synonymously now in our in our country in our political landscape and you know really it's socialism versus conservatism for me liberalism is 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 yes it's on the side of of socialism right now in america and that's how we define it um and who and where we define it but um you know we talk about uh, help from a healthcare perspective, and then also like we were talking about from the tax perspective, it's like we we're, we lose faith in socialism, and, and then it moves to communism. But you lose faith in the resilience of your people, of your populace, right? Who you know? Who are these people? These leaders of your organizations that are giving bonuses to their employees? Who are the people that are providing uh, uh, big giving uh, spending for charities and giving back and being benevolent and giving to those, the, the help providing healthcare for those who need it and those type of things. People forget about that. They're like, well, nobody's gonna do that on their own. No company's gonna do that on their own. We're, we're gonna need, we need to mandate that, right? And so it's this need for government to mandate, right? And then that, that, that segues into, here we are, we're mandating that my health uh, healthcare choice personally and everyone's healthcare choice personally affects your health, right? And I have a responsibility to put a mask on or get vaccinated because I'm responsible for your health. And so that is where it's the slippery slope of this socialist agenda is that I'm responsible for someone else 
based off of what my government is telling me that I should be responsible for. And I just think that we got to dial that back uh, extremely uh, on on a lot of fronts, um, from taxation to uh, the healthcare system, and now especially in this whole, uh, you know, you know, COVID mandate vaccines situation is it just, it's getting out of hand. It is. And, and so the biggest thing that we can look at is history, right? Sure. So we can look at history, the last thousand years of history, if we want, and never one time has the government on its own come through to do what's best for the populace. No, it's never happened. Never ends well. The people in power never choose to do what's right for the people, they choose to do what's right for themselves, right? And and that's, I think, one of the biggest issues right. that people don't understand. It's like when you say you're pessimistic about politicians, absolutely. fucking mm-hmm. uh, Career politicians, I'm complete, and it doesn't matter yeah. if they're super left or super right. Like, term, unfortunately, term those, those are the same. There's no term limits. You should have them, yeah. And if you don't think that the the career rhino Republican is no different than your freaking Bernie Sanders character, right? They're back to back, those yeah. dudes. And I don't think people realize exactly how deep those two parties go together. Right. It's it's not a matter of saying, Oh, I support all the conservative politicians and I I can't stand the liberal politicians. Right. No. Like it's they're, fundamental they're, design of your political system. Dude, what is it? Yeah, the front of that ties blue and the back of it's freaking red, dude. You can flip that thing over and no one knows the difference. Right. That's that's the reality of it. But these people have incentives, paid incentives to not do what's best for the American people. It's now, like, some do at first, but you see the the, the denigration of these politicians over the right. years. I, I don't know why we don't reflect or mirror what we have in the military system. It's a British, old British system, but it's implemented in the military where you will not be in command of troops in one unit for more than three years, and you have to be moved out for one for the risk of fraternization with those underneath you, one for the risk of, of, of getting too much power in one unit, right? And that's that's why they do that, and they continue to move these guys up the chain. And even, even generals, when you get to the top, you're only in that position. There's a term limit there for what you can have that power for. You can't be a five, five-star five general just indefinitely in the same position. You're going to get moved around, and then you get retired when you hit that. You know, I say five star. There's only been a few of those, but when you hit that that top of the food chain, you, you're there for three years and you're off into the sunset. And so, from a political uh, position standpoint, I think we need to you know mirror some of that and have some term limits because these guys that are spending decade after decade after decade on Capitol Hill, you it's inherently in human nature. You will begin to be a part of the system and there's no difference between you as a person and what you're contributing to the system and the system itself. You will be it and you will be the power. You will live and breathe and sleep that power and that's all you know. Even if you have the best intentions when you started out or even if you're wearing the right color tie like, or you vote on this side or that side, the power um, has to be regulated, has to be balanced. I mean, nobody should be in power, um, you know, too long. Yeah, well, and we can look at, at thousands of years of monarchies, and, and you see that, right? Like, you'll you'll see these stories, right? And, like, there's a, there's a great story yeah. from from the 20s, 30s, and 40s mm-hmm. in Germany of that there was a massive population who decided that the National Socialist Party of Germany, that would be the Nazis, was making the best decision for the populace. Sure. Right? And I think Adolf Hitler, he probably believed he was at first, and then slowly but surely, and not even that slow. Yeah. He all of a sudden murdered 42 million Jews. Yeah. Right. And, and decided that the, the, he was more or less the, the, the Christ figure for all the world. There was some, yeah, they rationalization. Should, there. They should march on the world. And it was such a rationalization. And so many people followed it that they were able to carry out those orders. And I'm not saying that that's what's going on now, but the demonization of one group by yeah. another is really scary. And it's not the same, right? right? Like right. you can never compare anything that's going on in modern America to what was going on in Germany in the thirties and forties. No. You can't, but what you can do if you study history is you can look at the linear progression of, Hey, this guy was going into pubs right. and, and screaming from the top of his lungs, what his beliefs were. And one of the things that I think a lot of people don't even realize about Europe mm-hmm. doesn't, doesn't realize about <laughs> Europe is all the parties exist. Right. Here it's a two party system. Sure. In Germany back in back in those days there were the there were the communists. Yeah. There were the Democrats. There were the Republicans. There were the conservatives. There were the Nazis. There were right. all these different groups 
that were constantly biting for power. Mm-hmm. And that that's in all of the uh, the EU countries. Like yeah. it's the same thing. Like you could look at it's same thing in uh, in your in uh, England. Yeah, the, all these different parties that are out there, and they didn't have Facebook or Instagram. Mm-hmm. They'd be out there swinging their hands, standing on top of pillars, and, and like trying to get a crowd so they could s- spread the word on why communism is the is the best choice for England or the best choice for right. Germany. And in 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 the being by a ton of manipulation and just who could scream the loudest that Adolf Hitler was able to seize power, right? Uh, and the Nazis were able to take over, mm-hmm. and they did it. By demonizing a group of people and blaming the mistakes that were made in Germany in World War One, and the fact that like you had to literally cart a wheelbarrow full of cash to get a loaf of bread, right, right. But but the Jews, they were, you know, they were prospering. Yeah, right. Yeah, and, exactly. But, but your your average German American, they weren't. And the next thing you know, we have the tr- the chaos that ensued, and then the mass murder that ensued. Right. And it was all because one man wanted power, and he was so convincing in mm-hmm. his approach to it yeah and, and that's and that's funny that's through traditional communication right verbal written communication literally. and word of mouth and now we're in a in a place where communication is overwhelming and you can withhold it you can change it you can screenshot it you can flip it you can photoshop it you can have talking heads that are saying what somebody else said lip sync it and there's so many different ways to put deception in in, 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 and to have propaganda on steroids right and that's what one of my biggest concerns is is it's not there's propaganda in those times like we talked about world war one and those type of things but now the propaganda vehicle is so strong and so fast that uh it's global and it's and it's just at a at a level that the human mind has a hard time keeping up with sometimes right our brains haven't developed past you know we live in a cave and we hunt yeah in the yeah. morning and we sleep in the afternoon right and like our brains haven't really got past that so when we get all this stimulation from from facebook and instagram right and the social pressures it's like like the social pressures that we get from like instagram right it's that's a fight or flight sensation like yeah. that might as well be a tiger chasing us into a cave like yeah. your brain functions the same way right in either scenario and and that's why and these people who created these algorithms for Facebook and Instagram and all this stuff, they mm-hmm. know that. Right. That's why it's triggered that way because they know they can hook you in exactly. and then feed, feed you, whether it's a pair of Nike sneakers right. or it's lib- – and unfortunately, it's not going to be conservative propaganda because they right. don't push it. Like, right. it's, it's not the same. Right. You know, that's, that's a little more pushed down specifically right. on Instagram, less so on Facebook, but specifically on like Instagram yeah. and, and definitely Twitter because that's more based on – Literally both well, – both both websites have sh- have had evidence saying that they pushed right wing propaganda, that they allowed it, not pushed. Yeah, no, that, the algorithm. And, and you're did. talking about the stuff that the that the media is putting out recently about yeah. Facebook and Instagram. So and I, there's a reason for that, but that's I, not the. Point. I say it from both sides. I'll say it in a fully fair and transparent way, right? We we've got liberal and we have conservative propaganda, right? Because there there is truth to conspiracy theories, but then there are conspiracy theories that were right-wing conspiracy theories and they go way beyond right there's a, there's a cliff and they just go completely off of oh, it right because crazy. of fear-mongering because of this dopamine rush of what's what's you know and everybody says that you know a lie will travel around the world uh 10 times faster than the truth will and i don't know if you've ever heard that but that's so true and so if there is any type of conspiracy or sensationalism which the media and especially social me- social media are built on those are the narratives that travel farther and reach deeper than anywhere than any other narrative, right? So the truth might be kind of right down the middle, maybe a little bit boring, and people aren't clicking it. They're not sharing it. It's the extremism on both sides. That's what gets shared. And so, yeah, you know, I think it, it probably ebbs and flows. It's a little bit of a, you know, it's, it, it's, it's a curvy road uh, of, of crossing the truth to both sides, um, and, it's, and it's somewhere down the middle. Um, but both sides have extremism, both sides have propaganda, both sides have conspiracy theories. And so that middle ground, uh, for truth is what I think people have to latch onto, right? We have to commit to truth and take it to the grave because if we're not fighting for truth, you'll, you'll fight, you'll fight for anything. You'll fight for some narrative that you don't even know why you're fighting for it. You know what I'm saying? So, and mostly um, it's because someone told you to, and, 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 I right, know you you're a religious man and all that, yeah. but I mean, there's a reason why in the Old and the New Testament, one of the 
pillars of fixation in the in the Bible. Right. And it's not just the Bible. It's actually a lot of the other religions, but like specifically the Bible because I'm a Christian and that's sure. what I believe, so I'm not going to go down the roads of the other religions. Right, but right, right. Even if you look in the Torah or the Quran, right. like one of the pillars, regardless of how skewed it might be mm-hmm. in, in the Quran specific, the Torah is not too far off from the Old sure. Testament, but one of the pillars of the Bible is you must live in truth yeah and we we know why lies are so dangerous because right. look at what it does yeah just completely divides people and and it, and it takes it to a point of you know uh world wars because of lies and propaganda and and we're not we're not out of the weeds on that like we've seen it like you said we look at history and we learn what the life cycle was of a person what the life cycle was of a of a nation and what the life cycle was of a generation and you know, people need to get very aware and very well versed on what the life cycle is of this generation and what what the implications are of, of what we're doing uh, politically, but just individually and with inf- information. And it starts with, you know, each person just taking responsibility for their commitment to truth uh, in their in their friend group at work, their their truth on social media. Right. We, we should all take a responsibility for truth because truth is the you know, it's cliche as it is, it's the only thing that will set any of us free. And it's the only thing that will be at the end of the day is truth is going to stand. Everything else is going to crumble around truth, you know. So, um, yeah, I, I don't know. We we need we need some truth warriors out there politically more than anywhere else, and 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 even more so in the media, mainstream media. Truth is 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 a word that I mean I would scare them to death, right? I, I don't think there's there's just rarely truth, right? It's no, it's, it's it, such it, a minority of what they report. Everything's a narrative. Everything's sensationalized. Everything's blown out of proportion. I'm like, man, y'all have got such a platform. You got so much attention around the world. What you say matters. And I'm like, these even these reporters, these people that become the famous celebrity talking heads that people listen to on these different networks and things. I'm like, do you? I don't think that they realize like they're, they're chasing the dream. They're chasing the success. They're chasing the ratings. And that's what they're gauging it off of. I'm like, do you realize the responsibility on your shoulders to tell the truth to the world? Because you are the outlet that, that they're receiving uh, what they believe is the truth. And you, it's on your shoulders to give that to them. Cause if you don't, you're going to cause world wars to happen. You're going to cause people to die because of what you're saying on air. And so. it, it goes, it certainly goes, happens with both like CNN, oh, it, MSNBC it, it, and Fox in terms absolutely of those, sure. those weekend, those weekend, not weekend shows, but those primetime night shows. And there, there's not really good indication of it, but these are opinion shows. These are not supposed to be hard news shows. These are going to be opinion shows that are talking about what the, what's going on in the news sure. and their opinion specifically. And I, I am a journalist major and I will say that's a really down far at least with the 24 hour ne- news networks. Now yeah. you're not going you're not going to see those opinion based shows on normal news networks like CBS. Right. They're NBC, reporting on NBC. local news though, not national. Well, no, news. well, not even, yeah. well, not even not not even just the local ones, but the national ones for those for NBC, for ABC, like ABC national news and stuff sure. like that. You're not going to see that opinion based stuff. You might see some sh- talk some uh, round circles on those right. shows, but. The but people there's not really good indication of that these shows are opinion based when it comes to Fox News and CNN. Well, you you know that's the other part of that too is there is the shows that are framed as opinion based, which are your prime time late night shows. Your on um, Fox, you know, it's your Tucker Carlson and and your Hannity and those type of things. On CNN, it's Don Lemon and and uh, Cuomo and those guys. And they're opinion based. Everybody kind of knows that. That's the pre, that, you know that's the premise. They don't, for the it. problem but, with with CNN and those people in specific is they yeah. don't present themselves as an opinion based show. They don't. Right. Well, and Fo- Fox does the same thing though. They have oh, their Fox News oh, alerts during oh, well, the same show. And shows. I'll say this about Fox: they 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 will say it about CNN, and what they don't realize is like they'll specifically say it about CNN. Right. Like that. That's what they do. But then they're by saying that, that's what they're they're doing, doing it themselves. And, and at the end of the day, like. Tucker Carlson, Don Lemon, Cuomo, whoever, yeah, Sean Hannity, you name the person. Uh, Andrew Gutfield, he's hilarious, by the yeah, way. His yeah, his funny great, guy. But uh, I think he added some up. humor to his opinions. Oh my god! Finally, yeah, like it's a late <laughs> night show and it's a good one. But yeah. uh, it at the end of the day, they are working for ratings, and right. the number one thing that a Don Lemon or or a Tucker Carlson gets if they do their job well is fame 
and yeah, fortune. Exactly. And that is the number one motivator for the reason that they're on TV. Right. And they might be able to slickly, especially Tucker, and I like Tucker, but I, there's very few people who can slickly push their opinion and their agenda like he does. Like, those guys on CNN don't hold a candle to him as far as spinning verbiage. Like, right. he's really good at it, which is why his following is so big. Right. It, but it's dangerous because it's also propaganda-based right. in a way. Like, just like Trump was a wet dream for CNN, Biden, fuck, he is a wet dream yeah. for Fox, and they're taking full advantage yeah, of it. That's why their up. ratings are the highest that they've been. Exactly. Because it's the perfect situation for them to capitalize right. and, and it, that's just the way it it's, is it's by design and that's why all these guys they bring on they bring on the one minority viewpoint right cnn brings on a conservative they had kaylee mcenany on cnn you know before she was the press secretary as the conservative voice right and then they all just like jump you know jump on her yeah, and, and the, just argue and, and against then they her sound bite her and they cut her right like, yeah, exactly that, that was the problem and the, so fox does the same thing they, they, do they bring on the other side and they do the opposite and then but then what even bothers me even more is like the nbc and and and, and what we were saying are the the local news and cbs the nightly news with brian williams and all those things they're from a produce they they still present it as i'm just reading the news what happened today whatever but they still present it. The producers hold that power there. What they present and what they omit to not talk about today, right? There's only 30 minutes or an hour or whatever to talk about in that programming. And there is a lot of things happening in the world. And it's what they choose on the wire overall in those five big media outlets to talk about. That's it, right? And they're not going to talk about it. They can't go outside of that. They have their parameters to set. And so they can present it as fact-based news. But that fact-based news is given in a fact-based fact -based angle but it's not fact-based news half the time. Sometimes no. it is, sometimes it's not. The only thing no, that's fact-based is that when the only thing that they really aren't propagating is is when the you know the panda has a baby at the zoo. You know what I mean? <laughs> that's that segment. Maybe the weather. The weather's even propaganda. They're just making it up. Yeah, so exactly. Um, anyway, guys, rock and roll denim has absolutely changed the game when it comes to the performance and style in Western jeans. Top competitors like Shad, Tim O'Connell. Shelly Morgan, you name it. Your boy right here. We're all wearing rock and roll denim inside and outside of the arena. It gives you the flexibility you need to win as well as looking absolutely great in your interviews, appearances, whatever it is you're doing. Even when you're just doing podcasts like me. I had a chance to go to Rock and Roll Denim's factory the other day and pick out all the pants I wanted. Here's the thing. I got to try on a bunch of their new jeans. I love the men's revolver jeans with the reflex stretch technology because they're comfy. They're not stiff like some of the other jeans. Go check them out at rockandrolldenim.com or follow Rock and Roll Denim on Facebook and Instagram for the newest trends in Western fashion. Rockandrolldenim.com. Guys, let me remind you how much we love Pendleton whiskey and how much you'll love it too. Here's the thing with Pendleton. It's not on every single shelf in the entire country. Sometimes you go to those small towns where the small rodeos are and you can't find Pendleton. That's where drizzly.com comes into play. Satisfy your inner cowboy by purchasing your bottle of Pendleton whiskey online. Buy it online at drizzly.com. Put it in the trailer. Pendleton blended Canadian whiskey, 40% alcohol by volume. Pendleton Distilleries, Lawrenceburg, Indiana. And please drink responsibly. But anyway, so yeah, we, right. we really went down some political rabbit holes, which yeah. I, I have to admit are my favorite ones. Yeah, well, I mean, but. it's funny because in you even in this exercise, we get the the temptation and the sense of where sensationalism comes from, right? Mm -hmm. You're producing a podcast. I'm interested in it. You're interested in it. The viewers, uh, listeners are interested in it, right? And so then you're like, well, if you have a, a major news network, how tempting is it to just talk about what is the most, you know, fire-driven thing to talk about today? And uh, that's that. It's tough, but those guys need to understand that the responsibility that they have is world changing more than. I mean, and now it's Zuckerberg and uh, God bless him, the guy at Twitter for what's his name? Jack Dorsey, yeah, brother Jack. So pirate Jack with the beads and his what a, beard. What a what a weirdo. Um. Anyway, so those guys have so much power right now, and I don't know. It doesn't seem that they are carrying the weight of that power and that responsibility that they have to the rest of the world. Yeah, I mean, when you look, when you hear Jack Dorsey talk, like when he went on Rogan, for instance, like yeah. he just seemed like a normal guy. Right. And you're like, man, if you're that normal, then what is the deal? Why do you keep right. pushing propaganda? But neither, neither here nor there. We could be here all night, and then you'd miss another flight. <laughs> you really would have to drive home. But 
Yeah, I'm sure because you're you're the second person I know who uh, who spent time on the Bachelorette. Oh, nice. And uh, who was the first? Sean Booth. Oh, okay. I think it was the season before. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I know Sean. He's in Nashville um, as well. He's so. in Nashville. Yeah. yeah, yeah. He had a a little business venture that uh, I helped him out on a nice. few years back. He okay. Quickly gave up on it, and then I helped him get out of it. But uh, yeah. <laughs> he's a really cool guy. But. Uh, he don't want to talk about it very much either. So I'm assuming yeah. people who are on the show really don't like to talk about it. Yeah. But it's a really interesting thing because I just spent all this time with you. We talked about your past and then we went down some political rap. We really did. That's is, not going to make is, the cut. Which is great. <laughs> yeah, which is great. But I am curious just about a few things. Like, because you're talking about these things as they apply to political things. But then we we saw like, and I don't watch The Bachelor. You'll forgive yeah. me or The Bachelor. Yeah, uh, you're good. But me neither. what was Chris Harris or whatever? I did see where he got removed yeah which was interesting i don't yeah. even really remember what it was for but yeah well i like you know it's like it's it's somewhere. funny yeah it's it's it, your, your words can get you in trouble you know and they make or break you and even if your intentions aren't that your words can do that and so that's i think that's the case that i don't believe that i knew, I knew chris for a while and his uh his intentions were i think good very good yeah and just got he was playing devil's advocate basically like taken up for someone and that climate the political climate was so tense at the time when he was having those conversations that uh it took him down you know and it's like once a bell is rung um in anything entertainment world or celebrity world or public eye world once a bell is rung you can't unring it you know and that that's the case and so um yeah it's 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 funny um yeah you know the bachelorette whatever I did it. I was at a time in my life, you know, I'd kind of, I'd gotten out of the military, worked in the oil company, worked at the consulting firm. And I was, um, I had always loved country music and I, I, I wanted to do that. Learned, learned how to play piano when I was like 10 years old and then pick up a guitar when I was at West Point and I was in Afghanistan. It was like, you know, the guitar and just playing country songs that I had learned as a kid and grew up on was like my outlet, you know, it was my connection to back home and just kind of my, my place to get away from everything else. And so I had that passion for that in my life and it was an itch that I needed to scratch. And so, um, you know, when I was leaving the consulting firm down at college station, I, uh, I had been playing weekend shows and, and, and nights and, and I was single at the time and, um, had just really been focused on, I was, you know, my work there at the flipping group. And then I was, I was playing music otherwise and, and traveling to Nashville for a week at a time or on the weekends to go meet songwriters and try to, make a transition happen. And, um, so I, I, I did that. And so that was another big transition in my life. Right. And so during that time in Nashville, man, I was, I was just slinging whatever. I had a couple of rental houses. I was trying to figure out that with that transition because I left the corporate world and, uh, and I was getting into the entertainment world. You know, I was aware of that. I was like, it's country music. I was like, yeah, let's do this. And then I got this call about doing the bachelorette, man. I was like, uh, you know, they called me. I was out there. I, th- I think at the time I was even like I was driving Lyft on the side, um, had, having moved to Nashville because I was like I, I left the corporate world. I was like, oh man, I got to make ends meet. Driving Lyft, renting houses, I bought a Sprinter. I was renting that thing out to uh, other bands and stuff. And uh, and so I got a call, and this lady from L.A. You know, hey, uh, we're, we're we're at the Bachelor, and we want to just come to Nashville and sit down and visit with you about doing this show. I was aware of the show. I'd seen it you know, before. And, uh, I was like, ah, why not? You know, here I am, I'm doing, I'm shaking my life up. Why not? Let's shake it up some more. And, uh, so, but like a lot of things in life, you don't know what you don't know. And so I went into it very blindly and just, just experimentally and, um, wanted to see what the experience was like and just try it. And if it worked, I just believed whatever they were telling me. And so, it was a great social experiment. It was a great experiment for me to meet people. I got more self-aware through that time. I saw what I looked like on camera. I saw what I sounded, I heard what I sounded like. Uh, and I, I, the self-awareness just began to grow even more. And, and so, but also the awareness of what, a, you know, an ounce of fame or whatever it looks like, you know, and whatever, you know, I got a peek behind the door of like celebrity life and that type of thing. And how, really at the end of the day how dark that that world can be Uh, i can't imagine you know the 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 perspective that some of these folks that are truly full-time actors and stuff and and some of the challenges that they face in 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 la and those type of things because 
uh, it's just a machine, you know, that can really, you start being a slave to that machine, you know, and you feel that even as a reality TV person and then social media obviously is present now over the last decade. And so you begin this, this temptation to, uh, adhere to the parameters and the rules of what you think the followers or the viewers want to see or want you to be or what they think they, that you should be. And so that's a, that's a weird position to be in. Um, cause it came completely out of just an anonymity, you know, uh, for the most part in, in, into that world, into that spotlight. And geez, I, I you know, I'm glad that I, it happened. I don't regret it. Just like anything else. I learned about myself and learned about life a little bit more, met a lot of people, got a lot of opportunities. Um, but gosh, I'm glad that I'm past it. You know, I'm to a point where, uh, that doesn't, you know, uh, dictate my, my life decisions in any way, right? It's like you kind of take take control of your life and your destiny and your purpose again and say, all right, this is my real purpose in life. And you kind of continue to keep that intact or, or re-intact. And uh, so, yeah, it was good. I, I, I don't I don't regret it, but it was, it was wild. I mean, I, I wrote a, you know, I was the horse guy, the cowboy, you know, from Texas, the veteran, whatever. They kind of like they give you banners and, you know, uh, they want to name you, put you in a category. And uh, <laughs> so I did that show. And here's some things that I learned. Um, a lot of people love that show. A lot of, you know, women across America, across the world watch that show. Uh, there's 36 different countries that run a version of that show and license it. Um, but there's a lot of people that don't like that show and you like completely lose their respect for even having done a show like that. And there's like, that's something I didn't know any of that information going into it. And so it was funny, you know, um, coming off of the show, getting a lot of social media followers, all these things. I'm back in Nashville. I was riding on the high, you know, I was kind of just naive to the whole thing. What's going on. And I've got country music stars and stuff that like know me by my first name and they're want to hang out and people that I listen to on the radio. I was like, man, this was all looking pretty bleak. Like this transition to Nashville was never going to happen or be cool in any way. Um, and now people, I, you know, they know me on a first name basis and I'm chit chatting with these people. I'm doing red carpet events and all these things. And you kind of, and you ride that high even more and you're like, man, this is awesome. I could, this is going to go well. And after a few years go by, you kind of realize that <clears throat> maybe it wasn't me that they were really wanting a relationship with. It was just the hype. You know what I'm saying? <coughs> yeah, cut that out. <coughs> Why? What's what's going on with cops? Is there something associated with that? I got COVID, I think. No. Oh, well, you got it from that microphone. No, We've no, never cleaned no. it. Yeah, it was just like the 120th episode. Trust no, me, it's been clean. I'm just talking a lot. Yeah, there's some and, weird uh, people who are basically deep throwing that microphone. We just oh, left okay, it. all right. Yeah, so that's probably where you got good the to know. Got a couple strippers in here talking on this mic. Well, let's just say when we first started out, we didn't pick our guests well. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> all right, ranch water. Yeah, cleared it up. Okay. Anyway, <clears throat> um, yeah. So what I learned is that you know people, especially in the entertainment world many times they're not going to pursue a relationship with you. Right. And they're just chasing the hype. And that's what I've heard now later, you know, everybody that lives in LA or does that grind. That's what they tell me. Like everybody that you meet, they want to know what you can offer them. If you have enough followers, if you have enough clout, all this stuff. And I just saw that on another level that I'd never seen it in my life, you know? And at the time I was flattered, you know, I was like, Oh man, you know, does so it go to your head a little bit. Yeah, I mean, I felt like I was grounded as a person. Like, I didn't I didn't let it, you know, change who I was, but I was so naive to the effect of it. Like, I took people for what they were presenting me with. Like, oh, I want to hang out with you. I want to play golf with you. Come, over, come to our house. Come to our grand opening event. You know, do this, do that. And I was just saying yes to all these invites, you know, because I was flattered. And those people, they didn't want a relationship with me, you know, it was, it was, they just wanted the hype at the time. And, and that, I was the hot, hot topic there in town for a little bit. Um, not the hottest topic. I'm not gonna say that. I'm just saying like, I was a, I was a buzzword, you know, for the radio shows and stuff like that. Um, 
you know, I had a beef with Bobby Bones and stuff on Twitter and whatever. You know, he's like, come on the show. Then I was like, you know, politely, I didn't know. I was like, well, I, I'd love to come on and talk about the show. I was like, I don't have any, you know, music to play or anything. And uh, it, it was like, he was like, oh, what do you mean? You're turning me down. I'm giving you a chance to come play music on my show. Like on Twitter, he tweeted back. He's like, how is this guy turning me down? He like already tried to turn the audience on me. Mm hmm. And he didn't, I never even met the guy, right? I didn't, it was no ill intent by me. I just was overwhelmed by like that, even that request, right? Because right. it's like every country music person, they, you know, they, they want to get springboarded by going on the Bobby Bones show, you know, stuff like that. And so I was like, man, this is, this is coming in, coming in hot. It's kind of like drinking out of a fire hydrant, you know? And, um, yeah. And so it, <clears throat> I went through those times. I think there was times where it, it got to my head in, in the sense that I was just saying yes to everything. And I was flattered by everything. And um, that stuff doesn't last, you know. And so if I was telling anybody listening today, you know, uh, if you've got, um, you know, 300 followers or 300,000 followers or whatever, and you're going to a million, sure, there are businesses that, and there are career paths that you can monetize followers. And there's a balance of that. But don't wrap your life goals around getting more followers, getting more hype getting more clout because that stuff doesn't last right be yourself be who you are and if you have a purpose you have a mission in life that people can get behind and you have a value add to society then whatever followers come with that it is what it is but it's residual it's not that you're chasing the followers or you're chasing the clout and i think that was the big um you know switch there for me so yeah, that makes sense. I mean, well, uh, I don't want to do overly dwell on it, but it's an interesting topic, and I think a lot of people would be interested to hear because you know, we have a, a large female audience, and I bet yeah. you all those breezies watch that show. Yeah, yeah. Because uh, that's just what women do for whatever <laughs> reason, because it's like, I don't know what it is about it. Whatever yeah. it is that they created there, it makes a lot of sense. But right. it when you come on a show like that, I mean, do, do they groom you a lot to try to make sure that you don't deviate too much from what, like, the – the producers want you to do i mean i'm sure being from yeah. your background that's probably a was a tough thing to do yeah you know they do pretty pretty in-depth vetting before um so you know you go through a lot of psychological things uh you know uh, evaluations and you go through a lot of surveys and you go through a lot of multiple multiple interviews and so they try to bring in people that they feel like are not going to press the envelope and 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 be uh, too extreme of a character or anything like that. You know, I, th I think that they vet that out. Um, and then when they capture the content, um, you know, everything's in a controlled environment. You don't have any phones. You don't have any TV. You don't have any music. You don't have any type of media whatsoever. It's just you and them. They sequester people in hotel rooms for four or five days before they even start filming. And then much of the time that you are filming, you're sequestered in a hotel room waiting on your time to be filmed. And then you go back in your, you know, quote unquote kennel or whatever, mm -hmm. you know. And, um, and so that's just how that they, they design that and it works. They have full control of it. They have, you know, um, double digits worth of, of cameras and crews that are running around at, at all times. And not to mention the, the static cameras that are mounted in all the, the filming locations. And so everything is controlled. They can cut everything down. You know, they 95% of what they capture is then cut and they're only using the 5%, right? And so that's how they really control the the narratives and you just kind of let things play out. And, you know, people are people, it's based around what people do naturally, right? Jealousy and love and, um, and, and puffing and, and, uh, self-awareness or the lack thereof and all these things are normal human elements and they just exploit that, you know, and, uh, and, and emphasize it. And so it's cool from that standpoint. I mean, I majored in, in college, uh, uh, sociology was a major for me. And so, I, I appreciated the um, human experiment there. And it's like, I tell people, it's like the Hunger Games, you know? <laughs> it's just nobody's died yet on The Bachelor, right? Like, they're not killing people. But, like, the, the, the control room kind of feel of saying, oh, let's put a fire over here in the woods so that they run back the other way. And then, you know, that's very much how they film that. Yeah. Um, so it's interesting. Yeah, you probably don't leave a show like that with any, like, genuine human connection, though, right? You know, it's 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 been fun. I've I've watched over the years, right? There is whatever the norm is right now for 
relationships, right? Uh, the divorce rate in America is over 50% or whatever it is. So that's the norm, I guess, the baseline. Um, but then you have a show like that, and is it reflective of what you see in the real world as far as the success rate of the relationships that come out of it? And um, it's not. You know, there, there's a few, but it's like 90%, and I think more so over time, 90%. Are they they break up within you know six eight weeks after it's over? Um, some there's a small percentage that that do. Um, there's a guy here in Dallas that uh, he met his wife on there. They got I think three kids now, and he was on there like ten years ago. And uh, um, his name's Sean Lowe. Great, but you know his, the reason that worked for him is he was I think he was very well rooted in his value system and his faith and those type of things. And so there was, he wasn't really necessarily chasing the hype, I think. And I met with him um, after I did the show and it was just, he was very humble, down to earth, very uh, grounded. And it, and it worked for him. You know, he's been happy and, and married all from that show, um, albeit. But most of them, it's a People magazine cover and then, you know, you move on to something else. So uh, interesting human experiment for sure. So the funny thing for me, one of the big deals I learned is, so I was playing country music, like I said, on the weekends and stuff. Um, in College Station and around Texas, private gigs, whatever I could get. And it was this was all before the TV show. And, uh, you know, I'd go play a wedding reception or I'd play at some random bar in Austin or, or, or San Antonio. And, you know, I'd have people come up after the show, guys, girls, all demographics, and they'd be like, man, oh, that's awesome, cool. Let's, let me buy you a drink, whatever. That's really cool, man. And what are you, you going to Nashville, you know? And they have this genuine one connect with you and think that like you're pursuing your dreams and that's cool and they like your music and whatever. And it was funny after the show, I was still you know doing music out of Nashville, and I would do a show and there would be you know tons of fans of the TV show that would come out and come to all these venues and I could I could go to any any venue um, coast to coast. I mean we played we played in venues in Sacramento to New York to Florida whatever. But there were a lot of fans of the TV show. And uh, and so then at that point, dudes that would have bought me a beer at a show in Texas before I moved to Nashville and before I did The Bachelorette, they were like, I got cooties now. You know, they didn't, they're like, oh, I don't know. My girlfriend watches him, but I can't, I ain't talking to that dude. I don't know what kind of stupid stuff he's doing with The Bachelorette. What is that? You know, it was like, it was like weird. It was like this weird, uh, I was like, man, that really backfired on I me. Mean, now these, things, these guys think I'm just like some like, playboy like you know la dude or something and 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 they don't see me as what i was before and right. they, i don't know how they ever will you know because the only reason they know me is because they saw me on that tv show so it, it's just weird how that happens you know those right. same those same guys if they saw me the guy in texas before the tv show they'd be like oh dude heck yeah man you know, let's, let's come out to the place let's yeah, go let's shoot some players, ars veteran yeah i mean yeah. you check the man box for sure but so go it's, on that yeah. it's weird how the the trends of of you know tv or the public eye can just completely take on a life of its own you know so yeah it, i mean you're still pursuing music yeah you know um it's what's cool about music it's a lifelong pursuit um sometimes you put more wood on the fire you know and i think uh, my time over the last five or six years in nashville i was very much pursuing it uh day to day i was riding every day i was, I was chasing that and COVID happened, and I think it's one of the silver linings for COVID is, you know, everybody in Nashville got shut down for live shows all of last year, and my last live show that I, you know, traveled for and really put effort into was, was like, February of 2020, and uh, and then COVID happened, and so I had some time to, you know, I was trying to do some side business ventures with the moving company and some different things that I'd started up and um, to balance out what I was doing in music because the music pieces, it's a marathon, right? It's like, not, you can't just snap your fingers and be Jason Aldean and, and everybody there knows that everybody in Nashville's, you know, grinding and, and working and, and, and trying to get a shot and a chance to have success and have a lifestyle that they like and have music that aligns with who they are and what it, they want it to be and their artistry and all that, all that piece of it. Um, and you know, I got to COVID and I was like, I reflected, I said, you know, What's my, you know, where am I at in life? What season am I in? What's the next season look like? I've spent four or five years here. 
And so I just, you know, I started switching my focus over and that's when I went into commercial real estate last year uh, heavily. And, and so I'm doing a lot of, in the commercial real estate space now. I love it. But the cool thing is about music and in the circle back to this piece is that, um, you know, my best song that I've ever written is, is likely still unwritten. It's like I can, I've got folks in Nashville that I write with and I can go back next year, the year after that, year after that. And one of these days I might get a number one song, you know what I mean? And so that's the cool thing. Like once you've established, um, the art, the network, the, the friendship, you can just keep working at it, you know, and it's, it, it becomes this, this just lifelong thing that you love and it doesn't have to be that you do it every day and you're depending on it as to make your living or whatever. Um, but it can be cool. So, um, that's kind of where I'm at. You know, I'll still put stuff out, um, here and there on Spotify, I find something I like or write something that I like. And I'm like, man, that, that is a hundred percent me and the world needs to hear that. Nobody else has put that out. Why not? You know, and I, I've got producers now that, um, in Nashville that I can call that. I know what they do. I love what they do, but that's a whole thing in itself. Just in Nashville, there's so many challenges in the music industry to the team that you put around you, like having chemistry with the producer and with the band and with, uh, managers and all those folks that one have, you know, your interest in mind, but then also that you gel with and that you have good chemistry with, and then a producer that can, um, you know, put together a sound that you're shooting for and that you're proud to hear, right? Cause sometimes you put songs out and you're like, this guy was producing it and we paid him to do it. And he's technically great Nashville producer, but ah, maybe it's only like 70% of what I thought, what I hoped it was going to be when I dreamed it up, but I can't go in there and just replace, take over his job, his job. He's a producer for a reason. Right. And so, um, there's decisions that you make and you're like, well, I guess I'll put it out anyway. Right. And you, do you, do you, lax on quality and say well i just need to go ahead and get this out i'm not gonna have another chance to do this or do you say no i'm gonna hold that not put that out because that's not me that's not my i'm not not proud of that you know so uh the music industry was definitely an interesting um season for me um and you know i still look forward to doing more there but i'm just not going to be playing uh 200 shows a year in every honky tonk across the u.s albeit i had a great time uh, the guys that were in my band um, love every each and every one of them. Most of them were from Texas and, and and ended up in Nashville as well. And and we had some of the greatest times, the greatest stories. You know, we're playing at you know to places that we never thought we'd be sold out crowd in Omaha, Nebraska, or we'd be in. I mean, we were in Manhattan and New York at uh, the High Line, whatever theater, whatever. And you know, you're playing to these crowds and towns and cities and stuff that you never thought that you would play country music in front of and playing festivals and you're one night you're playing in washington dc and the next day you're playing in san diego and it's just we had a lot of great times and a lot of great friendships were built um but like a lot of things in life i think it's a season for some and it's been a season for me and so um you know i'm continuing to find uh my purpose and 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 see where that leads me and so i think right now it's commercial real estate and uh and and <laughs> Like I said at the beginning, you know, it's like I wish I had 250 years, man, because I'm, I'm trying to do a lot with my life and I, <laughs> I want to lead like three or four different lives and see how they all play out. Because uh, you got that Tiger Woods element where it's like Tiger Woods, he played golf since he could walk, right? Since he could hold a club. And that's what made him the best at his craft is because he completely played it. He was trained. He was mentored every day of his life from being a three-year-old child. And so that's how you become. And he was given the God-given ability to match up to that. And so it's, it's a little bit tough. I like being a jack of all trades and, you know, kind of like, Oh, you're a Renaissance guy or whatever you do a lot of different things. That's cool. It gives me good world perspective, but sometimes I do envy those folks that like got to be a specialist in what their craft is. Right. And it's like, that's almost something that I, I don't know that I'll ever get to feel what that feels like. You know, I didn't, didn't get to feel that and say football. I didn't get to feel that in, in the horse world that I, you know, I thought I was going to be a horse trainer at, you know, 16, 17, 18 years old. I was, I was training. I mean, I trained hundreds of horses, broke colts. Uh, I went to horse shows. I was doing it every day all through, um, my, you know, formative years from the time I was like 12 to 18, six years there. I spent it every day. And, um, I thought that's what I was going to do for a living. And then West Point came along and college football and then the military and then, you know, the oil business. And you just keep going through these different phases. And I don't, I don't know what greatness is for me. I, I hope it's going to be in terms of, you know, relationship and impact and growing other people and, 
and preparing them for the challenges that that the world is going to inevitably bring over the next um, you know 100 years but um, yeah I'm yeah, at the end of the day I'm, I'm, I'm trying to step in the paths that that God puts in front of me and uh, and I hope that my purpose and my impact is 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 truly there yeah I, I mean <clears throat> you're very grounded and very well spoken and highly intelligent and uh, you approach things just with my brief experience with you from a really stable position and i think that's what people need and uh, i'm really happy you came on the show and yeah i've got a lot in common with you i've always always been called a renaissance man because yeah i'm the same as you yeah in, in those regards too many irons in the fire never, <laughs> never focusing on one yeah, right. enough and i get that and it speaks really deep to me and uh, mm-hmm. the way you articulate and the way you say all these things i think you've got a platform where you could do those things you want to do and, yeah uh, I hope you do, and I'm really looking forward to seeing what you do with it now that uh, I've got to meet you and talk, and I think we're going to have to do this again sometime. Yeah, anytime, man. I but, love it. Uh, yeah, it was it was awesome. I'm so glad you came, and I know you got to get all the way back to Love Field just to sit on the car. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, we should definitely do a part two sometime. 100%. Yeah, I appreciate you coming by. It was excellent. Yeah, thank you so much, yeah, Chance. Thanks, Luke. Appreciate y'all. This has been The Gage, hosted by me, Chance Conrado, produced and edited by our guy Ty Yeager. Shout out to the executive producers, Dustin Pointer and Cody Denton. Marketing and content produced by Riley Chone. Make sure to rate and review this podcast, as well as follow The Gage on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. And make sure to subscribe to The Gage wherever you get your podcast. We'll see you guys next time.